let me know what's here right now. What are you bringing here right now? Could you repeat it? Um, yeah. What is here right now? So what is your experience right now? Okay. And, you know, it's okay, hungry, tired, but would love to know at the level of your heart, your mind. Oh, I see some burnout. Okay. We should take a poll. I bet a lot of us can relate to that one. Irritated, feeling unseen. Happy after an open water swim. Mm. Contentment, presence, grumpy, curiosity, presence. Shifting out of planning, mind, worried. Mm, thank you. <laughs> Well, all, I will soft open for us, those who are just joining, we're asking, just to put in the chat, what you're coming here with. Um, I, I wish I could say I would just alter the entire night, depending on what's happening. But I can't. I am bound by this beautiful book and its structure. And I, I really struggled tonight because this chapter is so important um, and so dense. It really has to do with our sense of self the created sense of I. Um, and it is, it is, has so many different aspects to it, but teaching it over two weeks, um, it just felt like we would really lose the oomph of what's shared. So I'm going to try to really condense some of the ideas that Sokni is presenting here on, you know, how do we really um, find a way to, as our aspiration had from last week, how do we have a difference between the absolute and the relative. So last week we talked about the absolute and relative levels of bodhicitta, of the awakened heart. And that the absolute is something that can feel just unbelievably far away and impossible. And yet the aspiration of it really helps exercise our heart and mind. It's in a way, it's like a gymnasium for us to imagine that possibility. Whereas on the relative level, we can still do a lot. We can still be of service, be generous, be kind. Even if we don't have that absolute level of being able to have equal care, generousness, tenderness towards all beings, irrespective with no boundary, right? That's the absolute level. And this evening, I want us to start thinking about what is the absolute and relative levels of reality? And the simple, or maybe not simple, simple but not easy answer is at the absolute level, we really have an ability to see reality as it is. A reality that isn't mm, permeated and clouded and obscured and kind of misshapen by our projections, by our preferences, by our judgments, by our grudges, by our comparing mind. So much of our reality has to do with the way it filters in through those perceptions, through those individual experiences. And that is essentially the constellation of I, me and mine. How we see the world through the I, me and mind, that's our relative reality. It's one that's conditioned. It, it's one that really reflects all of our lived experience up until this moment. And so tonight we're gonna look at that kind of self-construct and various aspects of that self-construct. We can't get rid of it. Uh, there would be no point. It would be um, not actually a very effective way of moving through the world. But how do we loosen some of our constructs? How do we loosen some of those self-constructs so we have some space, we have some permeability? Um, and Sukhni presents just such a beautiful, <clears throat> um, clear way of starting to interrogate and investigate these levels of I. What are these levels of I? So we are going to, in some ways, uh, look at and blow up our sense of self. Woohoo! Who needs it? Um, and hopefully what we will find there, which Sokni pointed out to us so beautifully, is our spark, our essential, essential nature, which is emptiness, clarity, and love. 
So that is our absolute, that's our actual ground of being. Uh, and yet, of course, we have a, a lot of other remembered forms of identity and presence. So we're going to, I'm gonna start off by giving you just again, one, one simple um, invitation and um, kind of uh, orientation for us being in our space together. So this one slide I will share here. So inviting us all to uh, really consider what it means to be together in practice tonight. And first of all, that means welcoming you all to the San Francisco Dharma Collective in its ethereal edition. We are not bounded by time, by space. We are bounded by time, actually. Um, but at least not <laughs> bounded by space. We are everywhere. Um, we are empty. Uh, we are full. And so glad to be together this evening. So glad to be together this evening. And you know, just to remind us of the goals and values of our practice here together. Um, uh, like many of you, I was on a lot of different calls today, a lot of different um, screens that were in my view, and it can be exhausting, and I totally get it. Um, while we are all practicing in this unique format, it's really, it's really requiring us to have a new dedication to what it means to show up for practice. If we were all in the same room together, there is no way you would get up in the middle of it and go make yourself a snack and come back. There's no way you would actually open up your phone and start browsing through the internet for something exciting or ruminating on the news. So I'm really inviting you to imagine the same quality of physically being together. And so I am sharing here these paramitas, these spiritual qualities that are so helpful to keep in mind. Uh, the first one applies no matter what setting we'd be together, really having this discipline to apply the ethos of non-harming. And that for us might mean that uh, we're going to sit up and we're going to move ourselves to the side so we're not looking at the camera, but that we still have that presence and engagement of being seen and being connected to one another. I invite you to have the, dis the discipline, if possible, to have no other distractions. And it's not just a discipline to do that, not just a discipline to not check the news or other things, but it's a real generosity to yourself, giving yourself this full time to be here and show up. Um, and I really invite you in our collective connection with one another, the texts that we'll be sharing, um, that you really consider uh, as much as possible that ethos of non-harming and really being kind and generous, recognizing that all of us are cycling through so many different phases of this ongoing pandemic. How we feel one day, maybe I feel really grateful and joyful, but maybe Claudia feels, you know, irritated and annoyed. And really to help us see that there, there's a variety of experiences and all of them are okay. And as much as possible, withholding or at least noticing our judgment around that, which then gets us to patience. There are many confusing and annoying things about being in this format. Um, so really being patient with this way that we have to connect, which is for some of us a bit more challenging to stay attentive, to stay present. And most importantly, engage your joyful enthusiasm. Really enjoy what we have together, which is to be spiritual friends, to uh, come together and practice and learn and aspire. It's it's, uh, I, I say this, but it's true, the highlight of my week, um, being with you all, and I have a lot of joyful enthusiasm, so I hope I can share some of that with you. Okay, so um, I will just, I wanna lay eyes on all of you. So if you're going to uh, turn your camera off, I totally get it, um, though I, I would love for you to have it on, but for a moment, can I see everybody's face just so I can know who you are and truly wish you well um, and know who I'm seeing. Hi, everybody. So nice to see you. Hi. <laughs> oh, already, that feels so good. Okay, so we'll go ahead and, and get started in a practice. And this is a practice, a version of a practice I learned from Alan Wallace. And it is one that has gotten me through the absolute hardest times in my life. It is a compassion practice, but one that really focuses on identifying and working with the added suffering that we create 
in our own lives. So there is so much pain <laughs> that we can encounter from the outside world, through people we meet, through situations we encounter, through physical pain, through uh, all sorts of crises. And then there's also that layer in which uh, often this sense of self or identity adds more suffering, creates more complication. So in this practice, what we're going to do is actually engage head on with that additional suffering we create and have compassion for it. And hopefully learn how to release some of that in our past, in our present, and in our future. So we're gonna do a little time traveling. Make sure you have your time traveling seatbelt on, your Dharma seatbelt, both sides. And in order for us to get in this time traveling spaceship together, please find a posture that really befits a traveler of space and time, a compassion warrior. So I'll invite you to inhale your shoulders up to your ears and then exhale them down your back, feeling the openness of the chest and the heart. And again, inhaling your shoulders up and exhaling back. And one last time. And finding a posture that really supports you and a posture that you really feel the nobility of this practice, of taking this time to go inward, to explore, to excavate, and to transform. See if you can identify an uprightness, a vividness, or vigilance throughout the spine. And really tune into how the head is resting on the top of the neck. Inviting yourself to have a gaze with closed eyes or open that is slightly downward. But imagine as though the very crown of the head was just open, transparent to the sky above. And find a comfortable position for your hands. This might be folded in your lap or resting on your thighs. And if there's anything that's in the way of your free reign of breath at the belly, maybe give yourself an extra notch or two on the belt buckle. And as we enter this practice, I'm gonna suggest an intention for this one. From a beautiful writer many of you are familiar with. He has a poem and a phrase that begins with, make love of yourself perfect, deny yourself nothing. Maybe perfection feels too striving for you, but the idea here is that loving yourself is already perfect. And release that intention and aspiration and whatever it stirs in the heart and in the mind and invite yourself to find the natural rhythm of the breath and sensing whatever is easy to sense through the tactile experience of the body. As you gently monitor the breath, noticing the inhale and exhale, allow yourself to feel 
the sensations throughout the body, but without having them feel that they are yours. Notice when you're experiencing this as me or mine. And instead notice tension, tightness, heaviness. Notice the sensations as just sensations. And with joyful enthusiasm, apply your introspection, noticing when the mind has drifted away. And then relaxing, releasing whatever has captured your attention and refreshing your interest. In this simple practice of noticing tactile sensations in the body as we're breathing. Generate the kind of curiosity about the felt experience of sensations in the body that you would if you were seeing a new landscape for the first time, one that really inspired you. You wanted to notice every detail, every contour. And you didn't really associate it with you, just noticing. It doesn't matter how many times your attention escapes up and out into thinking. Continue to bring it back with this generous and kind affirmation. Coming home. Re-inhabiting this space of the body. And finding this simple awareness of what it feels like to be in this body breathing.
We'll now shift ourselves towards this practice of compassion, beginning by noticing what's here right now, attending to our inner environment, and recognizing if there is tension or agitation, excitation or fatigue. Just taking a moment to give yourself what you need in this moment. Attending with kindness and generosity. And giving yourself through your exhale the exact kind of soothing and care that is needed. This preliminary step is really giving ourselves a chance to notice where we are in this moment and see, feel, or imagine that we already have in this moment care and kindness for ourselves. And we'll now shift away from this moment and go back in time. bringing to mind an event in the last months or even years that we can recall as an event that was difficult, challenging. Maybe there was a loss, a disappointment, a disagreement. There are so many, many, many ways in which we encounter challenge and pain through our interactions with other people and the world through physical illness or limitation. And just bringing to mind a specific event or incident, not one that feels overwhelming, as though it may flood if you focus on it for too long, but something that still feels a bit raw or tender, bringing it to mind may evoke a heaviness in the heart, a softening in the face. And as we look back on this event, can we remember what it felt like in that time period? The heartache, the frustration, the pain. And maybe we can see that there was, of course, actual pain catalyzed by an event. And in addition, there was mental suffering that we may have added. Maybe we were ruminating. Maybe we were denying or suppressing. Maybe we were trying to control. Maybe we were critical of ourselves. And taking a moment to simply and soberly see the added mental suffering we may have contributed. And seeing if at this moment we can look back on this event as just an event of the past. One that we can hold with compassion and care. The one that we can release all added pain and suffering. So in this moment, imagine as though we could wrap our arms around this past self, provide the love, the support, the clarity and perspective of time that we have now.
and feel or imagine the possibility of freedom from any lingering mental suffering about this event. Maybe we can't totally eliminate it, but maybe we can at the very least reduce this added and additional suffering. Imagine as though we could use our breath through our inhale, recognizing the challenge of this time and then ventilating it at our heart, opening with warmth and clarity and exhaling out a compassion for this past self, for this past suffering. Inhale, drawing in a clarity and awareness and understanding of this and exhale, sending this compassion to our past self and to that past self that lives in us here and now. Continue with this alchemy of drawing in, recalling what was hard and difficult, and exhale, sending out warmth and love and presence. Take a couple last breaths of honoring and transforming this past and painful event and bringing it into the present moment of our compassion. And gently releasing this memory and the residue of feelings. And this time moving ahead, imagining the future, so unknown. And yet we can be assured that in the future, there will be causes and conditions that come together once again and catalyze pain, loss, discomfort, lack of control. And imagining our future self, and imagining the possibility that our future self could have compassion, clarity, and a real sense of spaciousness to hold whatever pain will arise in the future without adding mental suffering. So imagining this possible capacity of our future self Maybe there are specific events that you know lay ahead that will be hard. Imagining those and meeting those with this openness, this warmth, this clarity. So traveling ahead in time and extending compassion for our future suffering, the challenges we will invariably face. May we be free of additional suffering. We're making the distinction here between the pain that is inevitable and the suffering which it is said is optional. It may not feel like a choice, but we can have the aspiration to reduce, if not eliminate, this added suffering that our mind can create. Inhale, drawing in this heartfelt aspiration for our own freedom. Exhaling out this compassionate wish. May I be free from additional mental suffering in the future. I'm taking a couple more breaths to really clarify this intention and aspiration and extend it, project it forward. Mm -hmm. 
Mm, gently releasing this intention and aspiration and coming back home to this present moment. And scanning the inner landscape and considering, is there anything that is here now, today or this week, that's causing discomfort or pain in which we're adding extra mental suffering? Maybe we're being self-critical. <clears throat> Maybe we're blaming others. Whatever way in which we're adding extra layers, creating more agitation through our mind state, not releasing our emotions and letting them be, looking plainly and soberly, and identifying any areas where we could use some compassion, some clarity, and some space. And as much as possible without judgment, bringing to mind these areas through our inhale and exhale, extending this wish, may I be free of additional mental suffering here and now. Drawing in <clears throat> with that awareness and extending out that compassion, that caring. And while maintaining the stance of care and compassion, loosen the subject of this compassion. Instead, see if you can rest in this feeling of compassion towards yourself and towards mental suffering. Feel that this body and this breath is a body of compassion. Each breath drawing in compassion, each breath extending out compassion. And connecting to this deep, heartfelt aspiration to be free. Free of this added mental suffering. And allow the mind and awareness to expand and be open while still rooting or basing yourself in this stance of compassion and care. Clarity, openness, and warmth. And gently, without uprooting yourself from practice, see if you can wiggle your fingers with clarity, spaciousness, and warmth, and wiggle your toes with clarity, spaciousness, and warmth. And gently blink open the eyes. 
seeing all in front of you with clarity, spaciousness, and warmth. Thank you all for your practice. So I will look at the chat here for questions or comments and reflections. That practice has a couple different benefits or implications. One of it that I, I may have spoken about um, some of you who've been in sessions I've had before. One of it is that we have this unbelievable capacity to transform our past by bringing it to mind with compassion here and now. And this isn't just magical, wishful thinking. Truly, the way that we remember, the way that we live our past is more informed by how we feel in this present moment than what actually happened in the past. So there's been tons of research studies. If you ask someone in the moment, you know, how do you feel on Tuesday? You say, God, I feel terrible. Worst day of my life. But then you ask them Saturday, how was Tuesday? And if they're having a good day on Saturday, they say, Tuesday was awesome. Tuesday was a great day. Right? It's as though we retrieve that memory and we infuse it with this present mind. And so if we can infuse our memory with this presence and compassion, we have the possibility that that memory doesn't get re-encoded in that difficult and challenging way. Memory is so profound, so interesting. It's such an amazing and important part of our daily functioning. If we had to know our own name and where we lived and how to do our job, if we had to recreate that every day, it would be impossible. We need our memory. And yet our memory is also what kind of repopulates these reified sense of self. I am Eve, I am limited to this embodiment and this way of thinking, and I'm always this way. So it's our memory of ourself that can really create a solid and fixed sense of I. And also our memory of our past pain can really inform how we move through the world. An example I, I often give to illustrate this is when we experience heartbreak, it's as though we're experiencing a really profound and dense sense of painful memory. And for weeks and maybe months, that is really infusing and informing how we see the world. And sometimes we even think that's the way that we will feel forever, especially our first heartbreak. And then we recognize that that's actually a passing feeling. That's not I, that's not me, that's not mine. That's something I experienced. But we can see with that feeling of kind of remembering the loss at such that acute level, it really can inform and infiltrate how we see the world. So there's a really interesting way of really cons of being thoughtful and conscious about our memories. I don't know about you all, but uh, when I reflect on the past, often those ruminations are not the greatest times I had. <laughs> it's the hard times, the challenging times. And when I'm with them in the present, I make them real again. It's as though they're happening now. That feeling of being betrayed or hurt or upset, it just comes right back to life. So one of the suggestions and the practices that we'll be doing together tonight and the investigations trying to pull apart this solid sense of self is when we have those memories, can we kind of poke at them a little bit and really identify like, yeah, that was painful and terrible, but it did end. And God, that person was so terrible to me. I can't believe they did that. It's like, yeah, they had their stuff too. They were always changing and shifting as well. And not to let that person off the hook, especially someone who's been actually harmful. But how do we reclaim a sense of peace in this present moment? How do we not let those memories of the past still have so much added mental suffering in our present moment? So let's see if there's any questions here. Okay, so Nick really enjoyed sending compassion to past self. 
Um, any quest, other questions or reflections on that practice? Um, I know it's a bit of a different way of approaching here. Um, when I remember past difficulties, I often think of childhood parts. Is there a risk that thinking about, uh, about that parts adds to a sense of self? Yes, this is the double bind. This is the challenge. In order in some ways for us to dissemble self, we have to start like identifying all the parts of self that make up how we believe who we are to be in the world. And so there's a really interesting progression of how do we create emptiness of our self and identity and our self construct while we also actually need to have awareness. So the progression is kind of going from total um, kind of opaque lack of awareness. I am just my ruminations, I'm just my thoughts, I'm just my neurotic habits, I'm just my patterns to, wow, I have neurotic patterns and habits. I can see them to, there's no separation between myself and anything else. Just those last two parts, sometimes they're hard to bridge. It can take us a while. We need a lot of practice and method to go from that sense of I see you, I witness you, I observe you, I understand you, I will perform inquiry on these parts of me to those parts of me are just, they are as immaterial as, um, as clouds in the sky. That is a, that's a hard leap. And so I think for a lot of us, we need a lot of scaffolding to get there in a lot of different ways. Um, okay. So the next question from Claudia is, <clears throat> not letting those who harmed us in childhood off the hook, uh, but then forgiveness, how? <laughs> yes, refer back to um, Beyond Religion chapter four. Uh, the whole chapter on forgiveness there from that book, which is, you know, I, I think over and over this theme that we revisit is if you want to be happy, practice forgiveness. If you want others to be happy, practice forgiveness. And I'm using that word forgiveness in place of compassion, but the Dalai Lama really doesn't make any distinction between the two. And so we're doing that for the other so that we can humanize them and recognize that if we ourselves are not separate and solid and fixed, then no one else is. The terrible part of this person isn't the entirety of them. At some moment, they had an aspect of that spark, that basic goodness, because we all do. And how much harm is it creating for us to hold on to a fixed idea of them as bad? So I'm going to go ahead and... Um, give us a introduction to the first level of self that Silkney presents for us. <clears throat> he walks us through, you know, a variety of ways that uh, getting in touch with our sense of I. And the first one that he starts by telling us about is um, telling us about what is called mere I. Mere, um, M-E-R-E. -E. It's a hard word to say and be understood mirror. He calls it like our simple, our mere eye. And this idea of this sense of eye that happens actually very early in our childhood experience. So he says, <clears throat> at the level of the mere eye, we are able to discern some sense of difference. For instance, the distinction between being hungry or full, the sound of mommy's voice or daddy's voice, whether we're lying still or being carried or moved around whether we're alone or not. But the distinctions made at the level of the mere eye are very light. They run into a sort of continuous and continuously changing movie in which we're fully and vividly immersed. And at this point, it's completely our movie. People, objects, sounds, smells, and so on have no independent existence of their own, nor are our experiences independent from us. The very lightness of mere eye leaves a lot of space for our essence, love, and openness to flow. So this idea of, and um, he then goes on to talk about raising his daughters. And when his daughters are very young, when we have this early developmental phase, we actually don't necessarily have what's called a theory of mind. We don't know what's going on in the minds of others. Everything that we are experiencing, we think is kind of part of our own life movie. And in that space, when we are, you know, running around as little toddlers, taking in the world as though it was all for us, 
there's a lot of love and joy. There's a lot of just natural curiosity and openness. We don't need to construct it. We're not, you know, there's not as much running around thinking, what is everybody thinking of me? I'm not wearing any pants. Or, oh my God, what's going to happen tomorrow? Right? No, it's just like, this moment is everything. So this sense of mere eye is this kind of, it's childlike, it's simple. You can also think of it as sensorial, right? When we're in our mere eye, I was trying to invite our mere eye experience in the first part of the meditation. So in that first part of the meditation, we're just noticing what can be noticed through the body. Just coming home to that sensory, and not like, oh, my shoulder hurts, but just shoulder sensation, merely aware of this body without identification, without projection, without comparison. So <laughs> what unfortunately happens, um, you know, very quickly after that near eye is, is a sense of kind of separation and, and solidity that happens. Um, I think it's really interesting to, to consider this early phase and stage of our life and when we can get back there. I think many of us experience a sense of mere eye throughout our day. Maybe, maybe we get lucky to feel it once a day when we just are totally relaxed and then we have no sense of our preferred self. We don't have to present ourselves. We don't have to be anyone. We're just being. And we're not, again, engaged with the world passively so that we're totally uh, like, absorbed in a... Um, you know, like a movie or something like that. We're just kind of who we are, but there's not a whole lot of story behind it. That unconfigured self. You guys experience that? Do you know what I'm talking about, more or less? Yeah, yeah. I think it's really um, something that can be done quite well in walking meditation. So many of you like, yeah, what do we do these days? We walk and we cook. Those are our main activities, right? Um, walking is a great time to practice mere eye. Um, we can really just take in and feel a sense of what is it like to have my feet on the ground? What is it like to be moving through space? Without identifying um, necessarily who's the one moving and where are we going? Just to kind of sense of being. So that is this, this mere eye, which I think is, um, yeah, which is actually quite a beautiful place to be. And, you know, one of the reasons that we kind of, we want to essentially come into this ability to have the mere eye is, as Sokni said, there's a lot of natural feeling of just love and presence. Not like, I love myself because I'm good and I did something. Just a kind of love and presence. Um, so I want to read for a moment how he describes these differences between our absolute and our relative understanding of reality. Um, and mere eye is the first way that we start to kind of um, inform our reality. He said, uh, one way to understand absolute reality is through using the analogy of space, as it was understood in the Buddha's time, a vast openness that is not a thing in itself, but rather an infinite, uncharacterized background against and through which the sun, moon, and stars, as well as animals, human beings, rivers, trees, and so forth, appear and move. Without space, there would be no room for anything to appear, no background against which things could be seen. So this idea of like our absolute reality is um, completely spacious and open kind of mind-blowing um, and and of course there is like a lot of relative reality a lot of actual change a lot of things that are shifting all the time so he says that relative reality or sometimes called conventional reality is a level of experience that is fundamentally characterized by dualistic perception subject and object friend and enemy self and other good and bad on the level of relative reality, phenomena are understood as relative because they're defined by our relationship to others. A positive thought is distinguished as different from a negative thought, just as a short person may be defined only in relation to someone who's taller. Alone, that person is neither tall nor short. Similarly, a thought or feeling can't in and of itself be described as positive or negative, except through comparison. As I was taught, this level of reality is referred to as conventional, 
because it is the way most thing, beings experience reality. So I think that is a really interesting way to look at the differences there. With absolute reality, sorry, with, yeah, that absolute level, we're making no differences and distinguishes and comparisons. There's no way in which we are trying to define ourselves against something else or define others. But the relative reality that we live in every day is one of constant comparison. Comparing other people, comparing ourselves in relationship to them, often putting ourselves above, below, or at the same. But there's not really this sense of true and deep connection, true and deep openness. And so <clears throat> when we look at the mirror eye, it's the closest in some ways to this more openness. Even though we're in some ways, we're lacking a lot of clarity and awareness with mirror eye. We're really caught up in the experience of ourselves. Childlike consciousness isn't enlightened, right? Because then if you've ever seen a toddler have a tantrum, there's not a whole lot of equanimity happening. <laughs> it's a very self-centered experience. And yet there's still this sweetness there. So the next level that he talks about, which is where most of us spend all of our time, is what he calls the solid eye. He says, in the beginning, the solid eye is pretty much identified with our bodies. But as we mature, the solid eye becomes more abstract or conceptual. It evolves into a separate eye-ness located vaguely inside our bodies, maybe our imaginations. As we apply tighter, harder labels to our experiences, our thoughts, our emotions and sensations, we develop a kind of weighty thing-like quality. We begin to identify with our thoughts and feelings as dimensions of experiences that are inherently parts of ourself. We assign tr seemingly true or solid qualities to ourselves a corresponding process begins to evolve in which we begin to assign those to others. So he says with the solid eye, when we start to construct a sense of this is me and this is not me, it's the very origin of our separation. It's where we really start to lose a sense of being connected. And we also start to really intensely feel that sense of importance and vulnerability to this constructed sense of self. Now, <laughs> what's, what's really hazardous about the solid eye is it doesn't give us much room to breathe. If we have a very like, fixed sense of who we are, it's very hard for us to then really be able to evolve and change over time. The solid eye you know, also has us kind of uh, defending ourselves against maybe new versions or ideas of what could happen. Within the solid eye, we really we start to attribute ourselves with our accomplishments and with what we do, as opposed to a more simple or mere version of us. So I know many of you have, of course, heard these kinds of teachings before, this kind of how do we dissemble a sense of our self from something fixed and something solid, something that really gets in the way of feeling a boundless quality of space of clarity and of warmth. But I think if we start to distinguish between <clears throat> these solid ideas and then the kind of looser ideas of, of mere eye, we start to get a sense. The next level that Sokni talks about is what is called the precious or self-cherishing eye. So you guys may have heard of this idea of self-cherishing. And what's a little bit, um, I would say, inaccurate about that uh, that term self-cherishing is when we talk about this form of kind of I, it really has to do with our preoccupations, often which are enormously self-critical. And we get really fixed on an idea of who we are and how can we present that. Um, so let me read here for a moment. So this precious eye points to a terrible and terrifying sense of the consequences of being separate, established at the level of a solid eye. It drives us to focus on my needs and my wants, my problems and my story, above 
the needs, wants, and problems of others. Our eye becomes precious or cherished in the sense that it becomes the main channel through which all our thoughts, feelings, and actions are directed. This feeling of separateness urges us in two related but seemingly conflicting directions. The first is an urge to protect our ideas about ourselves, even when they're unflattering or destructive to ourselves and others. So what's interesting about this self-cherishing idea and each of these, the precious eye, the solid eye, and the mere eye have a different definition in Tibetan Buddhism. It's as though we need to investigate all these different aspects of how we construct our sense of self in order to start dissembling that sense of self. So with the mirror, with the precious eye, I think we really start to see kind of the habits uh, and the deeper meaning of what this does. It's, it's as though we're holding on to an image of ourself that doesn't apply anymore, but one that really gave us a lot of protection and security. It's pretty interesting because Sukhni and, well, Tibetan Buddhism are pretty right on at these developmental phases of how we construct a sense of self. So this mere eye happens very early in our life as we're starting to try to understand the world and take in these senses, uh, like our toddler phase. The solid eye is often happening when we're being told our name and who we are and who other people are. We're just getting the sense of you are this being. You are solid and separate. This, this kind of self-cherishing or precious eye is the story, the identity project that we create. And I'd love us to take a moment here and really consider what are the aspects of ourselves that we're holding on to that don't really fit anymore? Are there these self-cherishing aspects? Again, these don't have to be flattering to ourselves. Maybe our, our self-cherishing -cher idea is man, I'm really bad at communication, or I'm not compassionate enough. But we just can't let go of that idea. Come on, puppy. <laughs> um, so I'm just, I'm, I'm thinking for myself, um, I did a, a walk before our session together in which I tried to be mere eye. Uh, and then I would watch as the self-cherishing or identity projects of myself would come up um, and was thinking, you know, especially you can notice through the ruminative qualities of your thoughts, the areas where we feel like tender. Come on, Zara. Come on, girl. Let's go potty. Uh -oh. I'm going to mute them. Um, though that was a funny interlude. Um, <laughs> So what are these kind of ideas about ourselves, these constructs that we really hold on to? And I was noticing for myself, there was a real, very old sense of profound insecurity that I'm not good enough. And so a lot of the thoughts that were coming were, hey, you should do this. Because if you do that, you're going to be more liked and you're going to be more successful. And, you know, at this point in my life, I am unbelievably blessed with community. I have a beautiful supportive environment to do the work I can do. That insecurity, that idea that I need to do more and to earn and to be loved, it actually doesn't serve me at all. And that it's taking up this bandwidth when I'm trying to practice my mere eye shows me what a big problem it is. And so again, I think when we start to try to work with unraveling these self constructs, we have to look at them thread by thread and to get clear, what are these? I would love, if we can, to take a moment and into the chat for those brave souls willing to be vulnerable and, you know, expose ourselves. Here is this self-construct that doesn't serve me anymore. Here's a self-construct that's limiting me, but that I somehow hold so closely that's precious. Like, I can't let it go. It keeps coming back. And not that this is necessarily conscious. It's not like you wake up in the morning and you're like, I need to preserve this aspect of my identity no matter what. But it's, we can see it over and over in our habits and our patterns and often in the ways that we feel stuck. I'll give you a moment to reflect here.
trying to be the good daughter, sister, to be approved of, accepted, loved. Amen. Pamela says, no one sees me. Yep. I get stuck at being an introvert, Katie, yeah. Mace can never do enough. It's amazing to read, especially from my uh, spiritual friends here who I know well, and I'm just, yes, I see you, I feel you. <laughs> Expected to be the extrovert. <laughs> I know that one actually very well, yeah. The idea or concept of looking for what is wrong with me. It masquerades as how I can improve myself or be better or try harder, but it's a mind trick that allows judgment to creep in. Yes, clear seeing. Um, Stephen says, I'm going to fail at this. Mm -hmm. And no acknowledgement for who I am. Yeah. Why do we hold to these so closely? Why? They're so unhelpful. But they're what we know. What Sokni says is maybe a better understanding of the precious or self-cherishing I is the addictive I. That aspect of the self that becomes attached to and feels a need for something beyond the basic spark of warmth, openness, and curiosity to experience a sense of connectedness, of familiarity, of comfort. So Cassandra says that I don't matter, Mace, that despair equals compassion. Woo! That's a good trick. Um, I'm going to turn on one more light. I see it's getting a little dark in here. Let's see if this helps. Okay. Um, yeah. And, and I do think it's, I think it's helpful to, um, in some ways, call out, not in a negative and harmful, like mean way, like, oh, this bad part of me, but just to really kind of see, you know, that we have, in some ways, we are, um, you know, we are serving and we are loyal to these habits and patterns that really don't serve us. And if you, some of you may remember way back a year plus ago, when we were reading the Guide to the Bodhisattva Way of Life, this text by Shantideva. And in the first two chapters, Shantideva talks about the need for confession, that we need to confess our neurotic thought crimes in order to find our way towards freedom. And that's a really interesting idea, and one I think is, is quite useful. I think when we hold in these limiting self-views, when we kind of just, yeah, well, I'm working on it, okay? I'm, I'm trying, I'm gonna, I'm gonna meditate on it a little more. That we can actually find ourselves doing a spiritual bypass and finding practices that allow us to work around these really stuck aspects that we haven't loosened, we haven't been able to release. I've been thinking about this quite a lot lately and thinking about our, our role and responsibility to one another as spiritual friends. I consider us spiritual friends. And I hope that for those of you who are connected directly with others in this song that you feel that too. And when we're spiritual friends to one another, what that means is that we lay ourselves bare. We show our vulnerabilities so that then we can be available to really be transparent and show up as we are. How many of us get the opportunity to do that with even one person? Truly, right? Very rare. We think of our closest partner and maybe we feel that sometimes, but maybe sometimes also we feel like a little wary, you know, or like, oh, I'm taking care of myself and but wait, they didn't understand me or they hurt me. Um, this, um, this ability to be vulnerable and transparent, to really kind of um, you know, as Vajrayana practitioners would say, get naked uh, with a lot of your psychological baggage. That is what can open you up to the, to the teachings. Um, and I've been thinking about how we treat one another as the guru, as the teacher, how we treat life in that way too. And if we approach our life with that same kind of vulnerability, so this moment in time for all of us, it's actually much more than a moment. Are we on week nine? 
But this epoch for us, it's kind of forced a vulnerability. It's kind of forced us to be opened up. And that is where we can start having a relationship with life that's more open and more equal. And then in which the teachings are gonna naturally arise. So this idea that there is nothing in our experience that can't be transformed into the path, nothing. But that means that we have to approach it with this total openness, this total open-heartedness. And most of us, unfortunately, we're engaging in a lot of self-deception about how open we are. <laughs> we're like, I'm totally open. Once this pandemic's over, I'm gonna be really open. <laughs> but right now I can't, like, I no. Right. Or like whatever it is. So I, I just, um, yeah, I just uh, am feeling moved and touched by those who um, are sharing um, and who are connecting in this way. And um, there's a huge point to it. You know, there's a there's a relevance. There's a necessity. Uh, it's for all of us and it's for you um, and how we can start to engage with life with this openness, with this kind of radical um, clarity. And or if it's not meant for you in this setting, um, on Zoom, with this many people, I really invite you to seek out your spiritual friends, to really establish a clear, con like a clear kind of set of principles and ideas of, I want you to see me on the spiritual path, and I want you to support me on the spiritual path, and I want us to have a level of openness and vulnerability so that we can both improve. And what that almost invariably means is I'm not going to give you advice. <laughs> I'm just going to consciously bear witness to your suffering. That's all we can really do for each other. Let's be honest. Some of us might have a bit more resource. Maybe we can actually do a little bit of something, but to have that real openness, because I think what can get in the way of that openness with one another is someone tries to fix us or tell us it's okay. And then we just kind of retract into, oh yeah, okay, I'm okay. I'm fine. I'm fine. So how do we have that open rawness to our actual human experience, which is full of pain and discomfort, full of uncertainty? How can we do that with each other? So um, yeah, I've been really, especially in this time, thinking about the role of spiritual friendship for all of us. Okay, I'm gonna look uh, from Ben. I found that combating self-criticism is not <clears throat> a one battle war. Even if I can definitively win the argument over a specific criticism, um, e.g., I'm not stupid, I'm not ugly, there are a thousand reasons, the real energy behind the criticism will just go to other words, but really it's the same energy. The battles tend to have more effect if I have a big picture in mind while fighting them. It's a great um, insight, Ben. Thank you for sharing that. I completely agree. Um, and spoiler alert for part of what this chapter invites us to do is to find a time every single day to in some ways make that space for the big picture around these habits and patterns of self-cherishing. Like is there five to ten minutes a day where you can release that kind of as though you were like brushing off the residue of it and just be the mere eye or just be spacious, warm, clear awareness. And to make that deliberate, this is the time in which I'm going to release and shed the story of who I am, my limitations, my preferences. I'm just going to be me. I mean, that's why most of us practice, <laughs> right? That's the goal, um, is to give ourselves that refreshment of just coming into a non-conditioned state of presence with ourselves. Um, yeah. Okay. Sammy says, I have to understand my childhood before I'll be at peace. And is that an idea you have or is that a true statement? <laughs> I like being alone. Again, is that an idea you have or a statement? Yes, an idea that is holding me back. Yes, idea of both. Okay, good. So those are really, really good. I think especially that one of, I need to understand this thing. If I need to analyze this thing and then I'll be free. 
I do think in some ways it's another form of, you know, trying to control, right? And instead of just opening up to what life is as it is. And this idea, yeah, I like being alone. That's really, um, that's really, um, that's really what I prefer. When in fact, you know, sometimes, you know, one thing I, I find really interesting, all the research on our personalities, on our character, maybe some of you have been forced to take personality tests at certain points or just been interested. And one thing they've really seen with these personality tests that are so, supposed to be so definitive is we might have different ways of being at work, at home. We might even have different ways of being throughout different epochs of our life. We are always changing. So how could we have these fixed enduring ideas of I like to be alone or I am not good enough because we're, we're just changing and changing and changing and changing. And if we really integrate, integrate that direct knowledge of change, it can be a lot easier to kind of release the hold on a fixed view of ourselves too. Um, Mace and or Pamela says, 12 steps says figuring it out is not a tool. I completely agree. Figuring out is cool. It is cool to figure things out, like how to put a cabinet together. You know, you don't just wing it. Um, but the figuring out can be such a neurotic preoccupation for most of us. Such overdeveloped heads. And just focusing on the heart for a lot of these issues and softening. And softening as much as possible in a non-conceptual way, not in an analytic way, in that more embodied way. Okay, wonderful. So, <clears throat> haha, the next one after the self cherishing eye is, um, oh, sorry, one other thing about the self cherishing eye that, that Silkney points out is when we have this sense, it, um, when we have this sense of a kind of uh, uh, like a, a self cherishing that it can actually lead to us wanting more. Um, that a thing, we were seeking things from the outside to make us feel good. So the more that we have this sense of like, I am a person who likes this, the more we have to fulfill those needs. So he kind of is linking it a little bit to capitalism, which I'm always happy to throw under the bus. Um, and then he talks about this idea of the social eye. So we have the mirror eye, the solid eye, the self-cherishing eye, and the social eye, he says, the social eye is set up for conflict because what we're feeling inside may not be what we're trained to project on the outside. If I behaved exactly like this and how I should behave, then there's no problem. But I don't feel that way all the time. It's not in my nature. Um, so this idea that the social eye is the one that we create that we think people will love, that we think people will like and want to be close with. And there's this projected version of us that we try so hard to maintain, so hard. And that really creates a sense of inner dissonance or inner alienation, where we have this idea of how we project ourselves to other people. But what if we don't feel that way? And some of you were already hitting on that, which I don't always want to be the extrovert. I don't want to be the good daughter and the good sister. I don't want necessarily to hold on to this image that I've created for myself that I think makes people love me. Right? Yeah. The so I mean, <clears throat> I am, um, like all of us, I feel like I've led many lives already. Uh, I used to lead a life in which I, I brought people together a lot. Um, even and even before the pandemic that had started to slow a little bit and then I would get these like these kind of like uh, feelings of anxiety of oh my god if I don't bring people together anymore if I don't host people will anybody like me that's the version of me that I created that I believe is lovable and even if I don't want it maybe I'd force myself to do it and so there's this really interesting space here of starting to explore what is actually what we want, <laughs> what is actually, right? What, what, what we're feeling in the moment and can we let that be fluid? Because all of this isn't about like, if I decided I wanted to have people together, great, no problem, wonderful. But if I'm operating out of this fixed sense of responsibility to a version of myself I've created, 
I'm not really open to reality as it is. I'm kind of constructing the reality around me. Um, Susanna says, the social eye makes me think of an idea or identity I hold that I have to give or serve others in order to receive love. And I love to feel that freedom to just love and be loved without reason. reason. Oh my God. Two hands up. Who, who resonates with that? I'm only going to be loved if I give people love and I just want to love when I want to love. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And it is so beautiful to just have that natural upwelling of wanting to care for someone without an idea that you should do so. Yeah. So that, that social eye. And then Sokni, he does, he does throw us a bone, luckily. <laughs> There's a useful eye. <laughs> we don't have to totally annihilate, um, not just yet. Um, he says, a lot of people think that Buddhism promotes an idea of extinguishing the idea of I, self, or ego altogether. But the idea of extinguishing ego, self, or I is inaccurate. You may as well try to extinguish your hands or your feet. Hands and feet are useful. They help us type, drive, and walk to reach into our pockets to produce money for food. Um, and unless through accident or tragedy we lose them, we actually take our hands and feet for granted. Among his many teachings, the Buddha urged us to not take our eyes for granted. Many doctors, nurses, teachers, corporate workers, and other unsung heroes around the world use their social eyes and their solid eyes, and even the stories wrapped up in their precious self-cherishing eyes as a means of getting through the day. But they're not used by them. Once out of public view, many of the heroes of our world let go of their social identities, their stories, even their attachments to true or solid selves, and drop gently and gratefully back into the openness, warmth, and fluidity of the mere eye. So I love that, you know, I, I do think we have to have some sort of self-presentation mode to the world, or, or most of us do. <laughs> Maybe some of us are totally free, but most of us have to interact with other beings uh, who aren't just there for, for our well-being. And we have to show up as a human being, right? We have to show up as a human being who has a story, as a human being who is solid and not actually related to every other thing and we have to understand our stories of how we got here maybe we have to use the knowledge that we've accumulated and we even have to have our voice as an authority or an expert and we can do that all well and in a wholesome fashion as long as we're not as Sukni says getting used by it like the relationship is getting kind of subverted into one in which we really are giving and kind of donating all of our attention and all of our energy into preserving these ideas instead of using them usefully as props to help us move through and then when we don't need them ah oh, relaxing back into just the beauty of our own presence and awareness i think that honestly it's such a nice way for us to look at these different aspects of i and identity that there is a useful aspect. He says, as we contemplate the enormous variety of factors that must come together to produce a specific sense of self, the residue attached to those various layers of I can spontaneously begin to loosen and then dissolve. We become more willing to let go of the desire to control or block our thoughts, emotions, sensations, and so on, and begin to experience them without guilt absorbing their passage simply as manifestations of a universe of infinite possibilities. Oh, I love this. So he says, I'm going to say this one more time, when we become more willing to let go of the desire to control or block our thoughts, emotions, sensations, and so on, and begin to experience them without pain or guilt, absorbing their passage as simply manifestations of a universe of infinite possibilities. So this idea that we can really engage with a, almost a playfulness, almost a kind of um, joyful surprise at our identity project, <laughs> at all the amazing things that like show up in our day-to-day -day consciousness and awareness. 
and our specific sense of I. Um, you know, sometimes right when we first wake up and we don't really remember who we are, and there's that beautiful liminal space, we can start to kind of play with that a little, like, oh yeah, I'm Eve, and I live in this house, and this is what I get to do today, and this is what I like for breakfast. So it's almost as though we bring that childlike curiosity into the constructs of ourself. So instead of kind of being asleep into them, um, we're actually awake to them. And as such, they show us the infinite possibilities of what else we could be, what else we could be experiencing. So that's our useful relationship with the I. Um, hmm. And so Barbara says, I don't think I've ever developed a social I, and that creates problems in feeling connected. That's really interesting. Um, I mean, yes, again, the social I has a really important role for us in being able to in some ways have empathy or connect to others. But I don't know. I mean, we can use it well to our advantage, but ultimately, at the ultimate level, at the absolute level, we want our sense of care for others to be totally unbounded. We want it to be this, this deep care arising out of the fact that this other human being is precious and just like us, deserves love and wants to avoid pain. Other questions on this, on this presentation of many different eyes. So we went from mere eye to <laughs> mere eye to solid eye to self-cherishing eye to social eye to useful eye. All these different eyes. <laughs> what about the third eye? Good question. The consciousness of our third eye not covered in this chapter. <clears throat> and, you know, what's nice, um, so, you know, not to have a cliffhanger here, but the next, like, three chapters are the methods in how we start to cultivate a deeper sense of connecting to that mere eye or connecting to a sense of our absolute uh, the absolute reality, being able to see as it is. And that's done, or glimpses of it, through our meditation practice. Um, ben says, it seems like there's a logical reason to care, especially about myself, and act more on that than I act on my care for others, because I have more influence over my own well-being than others' well-being. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And, and I think it has to do with intention. So when we're caring for ourselves, it's not because of the self-cherishing eye. It's because I have a greater influence on myself than I do on others. And, you know, as many, as many of you know, some of the best teachings we get are in how the teachings are modeled to us, how we see people inhabit the teachings. So by becoming a true vessel, right, the entire Shantideva um, Guide to the Bodhisattva Way of Life is about creating this vessel as a vessel of compassion. And that is how we become warriors of compassion in the world. So absolutely. Um, Lori says, this does feel like a good time to be talking about these eyes. Uh, yeah, extra time with the mere eye during shelter in place. The simplicity for some of us of, of this time can afford us that sense of who we are. I mean, you know, it's really, it's, yeah, it can be really funny. We don't have to have as many social engagements. And I don't know about you all, but when I get to go a little while without having to engage with anyone on a social level, the whole like Eve show gets to like get turned down and it's quiet. <laughs> and I can just feel me without the, pre the, pre the presented version of me. And that allows me to feel more connected. <clears throat> Um, I want to share one last part of this chapter. It's one of my all-time favorite teachings um, that he kind of just slips in here. <laughs> he just talks about how important it is for us to understand the deep, ever-changing nature of, of how things are always changing and how there's always loss 
um, how there's always different shifts around and to not allow that to make us feel separate. And that sometimes the construction of the separate self really happens when we feel that changes or something difficult is only happening to us. Ironically or poignantly during this time of shelter in place and global pandemic, we, it's happening to all of us, maybe in different ways, but that is revealed. But he tells this story, um, I'm sure many of you have heard it, but the story is <clears throat> about a woman who lived in the time of the Buddha um, and her very young child died. And she was completely wrecked with grief. And she really just couldn't accept that her child had died. And she just was going to people in the village and asking them, I need medicine, I need my child to come back to life. And one person in the village knew of the Buddha and said, you should go see him. And so she went to see the Buddha and said, my, you know, I need help for my child. Um, I don't know what to do, no one's helping me. And the Buddha could plainly see that the child was dead. Um, and he very kindly said to her, okay, go back into the village and get three mustard seeds from everybody in the village who has a home where no one has been lost, where there's been no death. And so she goes about knocking on every door in the village and asking if there had been anyone in the home who had died. And then what is slowly revealed to her in doing this is that her death is so much a shared experience that she learns how to accept this reality because it's the reality that we all are in together. And so that idea of how do we move out of, as Sokni would put it, our imagined reality into the true ground nature of absolute reality. And part of that is the interdependence of just seeing how we all are connected. And part of that is looking deeply at all of these different projections that we create for ourselves, all of these different eyes. So I hope tonight we helped forge some of this interconnection, um, sharing with one another. And in our meditation practice, can start to investigate all of these different versions of I as we start to shed them one by one, one by one, so that we come into a real sense of being. Um, I want to share some really wonderful news, which is an amazing teacher and dear friend, the Venerable Tenzin Chioki, who is a monastic that uh, JP and Mace know for sure, and Cassandra, um, a really wonderful teacher, a social justice warrior. Um, and she's been a nun for over 30 years working in the prisons. Um, she did, she'll never say this stuff or let me say it while she's here. She did two year, two in a row, uh, three year silent retreats. Like she did three years and then they were like, by the way, we're just going to have you go back and do another three years. Um, she's an incredibly uh, warm, loving person and we're going to teach together um, Wednesday next week. So I really look forward to that. And we're going to focus on the aspect of um, letting go. You know, just that, letting go, no big deal. One night, we'll cover it, it'll be done. Um, so let's come together and just dedicate the merit of our practice. So find anywhere in the body, it's easy to feel yourself, easy to feel that mirror eye, that sense of just being a breathing and tactile body. Shedding a couple layers of who you are or who you need to be. And finding just this core essence of your beingness. Feel the strength of this, the trueness and stability of this. And from this place of stability and trueness of being really rooted in who you are, Then let's draw a heartfelt aspiration that ourselves and others could really be free of additional mental suffering. That each one of us 
and everyone that we are connected to and everyone that they're connected to and eventually everyone through this whole net of caring could know their true nature and could see behind the veils that all of us could be free, connected and happy. May it be so. Thank you for your practice. Katie or Mace, who's making announcements tonight? I am. Well, All I'm right. doing a Donna talk. And the first announcement is that we're just so grateful you're all here and please check the website there's events happening all the time um, a morning sit every morning there's a sit in spanish with a wonderful teacher um, katie right now is putting in the um, chat box a link to the page where you can donate and what i can say after the talk tonight is i definitely don't have three mustard seeds to give anyone but i have i have a donation to give <laughs> like um like I am grateful actually that I don't have three mustard seeds because the grief of being human brought me to the Dharma and it is the only thing that is really soothing and um and I just think the teachings are precious and this community is precious and um, we're sustaining teachers who are really important and we're sustaining the community while we look for a new space in San Francisco whenever people move back into physical spaces together. And um, whatever people can contribute makes a big difference. And it does make a difference to our teachers. Um, and check out the website. And I think that's it. Unless, Katie, you have anything more? Thanks, Eve. Thank you all. I hope to see you next week so we can really show Venerable Tenzin our her love and support. She's such a unbelievable teacher. She, and I just want to say to everyone, she is fierce, <laughs> like in the best sense of the word. And she's like, I love her. Yeah. So you should all come see Tenzin because she's yeah. rad. Yes. Oh, little puppy down there. Thanks, Alex, for sharing your puppy. Yes, this is, this is the pet hour now. Anyone who has a pet, we would like to see them. Oh, very cute. <laughs>